uh, let's get started. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Yang Tang. I'm a maintainer and the CGI lead of uh, TensorFlow project. Uh, my co-speaker, Yuan, he's a member of KubiFlow and a, a approver and a reviewer of KubiFlow's uh, MPI operator. He's also a maintainer of several open source projects as well. Unfortunately, Yuan is not able to attend this, uh, this talk because of the schedule conflict, so I'm going to cover his part as well. In today's talk, I'm going to discuss about uh, uh, large-scale distributed deep learning um, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, I'm going to briefly discuss about uh, TensorFlow, uh, discuss about uh, Kubernetes uh, operators, and also discuss about uh, KubeFlow, which is uh, the main focus of this talk, because uh, the, the operator we talk about, the TF operator, PyTorch operator, and uh, MPI operator all belong to KubeFlow op. So let's get started. So the before we jump into the deep learning authorization, I want to briefly discuss about the background of TensorFlow. Uh, as uh, many of you already know, TensorFlow is one of the most popular open source frameworks for machine learning. It was originally developed by Google. Uh, it has been open source since 2015. Since then, TensorFlow has seen quite exclusive growth both in open source and the machine learning community. At the moment, the most stable version of TensorFlow is 1.14, which was released a couple of days, several days ago. But the TensorFlow 2.0 is actually up and coming and will be released soon. I want to discuss about some of the uh, changes in TensorFlow 2.0 because a lot of uh, a lot of things has changed, and uh, that's actually uh, quite an impact to, to many areas we'll discuss in this talk. In TensorFlow 2.0, the biggest change is obviously is uh, eager execution. Uh, back in TensorFlow 1.x, uh, the, uh, the static graph uh, was executed, which means if you are going to run a program, instead of running it in an imperative way, you have to construct your graph and wait for the graph to be deployed. And, uh, and once it's finished, you get the result. This is obviously very good for production deployment, but it also has a disadvantage in that uh, if you try to debug, it's very hard to debug because you will not get the result immediately. So in TensorFlow 2.0, the biggest change with uh, with the execution model is that uh, eager execution has been enabled. You can just run TensorFlow like a, uh, just like a Python program very natively. Another big change in TensorFlow 2.0 is that uh, Keras essentially is a recommended high level API and all other model building APIs are pretty much dropped. In TensorFlow 1.x, uh, people have seen criticized the 1.x in that for high level model building, you have uh, several different ways. You can use TF estimator, you can use uh, TF keras, you can use uh, TF layers, you also have the TF sleeve. There are four different ways to build models. In TensorFlow 2.0, the decision was that uh, TF keras will be the recommended uh, API and uh, moving forward, all other method will be deprecated pretty soon. Uh, if you look into the TensorFlow 2.0's uh, workflow, you can notice that uh, everything started with uh, data input and pre-processing, which is handled by TF data. TF data is a pipeline to take the data from uh, other sources and uh, import that into TensorFlow's graph. This is one of the most important steps and this will be one of the focus of this talk because uh, the, the data processing is very much tied to the authorization of the deep learning. Uh, the second step, after the data has been imported into TensorFlow's graph, is a model building. Obviously, we talk about TF curves and TF estimator, although TF curves is a recommended way. 
uh, for training, now you have the eager execution. Also, you could use TF function to define a uh, to predefine a, a small graph so that the execution can be speed up. And finally, for uh, saving in, uh, training and inference, you could use save the model to save the, uh, save the model you build and reload back. So that's uh, TensorFlow 2.0 workflow. If you look into that, you'll notice that uh, uh, data input preprocess and model building probably are the um, uh, are the steps that's going to be needed before you do the training. So people all, always ask question. I'll say, okay, why? What, what's so special about uh, data input uh, model building, and how to apply that when you have a big cluster? So that's uh, come up with the topic of altruism for deep learning. When we talk about uh, uh, altruism, we actually talk in Deep learning, it, it has a very special meaning. Most importantly, uh, altruism for deep learning is always tied to the GPU. We all know in, if you want to run a, a deep learning task, you are going to deal with I.O., which is, could be input output. Uh, most likely, it's going to be uh, network input because uh, the data will be loaded from disk to memory pretty easily. And then the second piece is a CPU. Uh, CPU is pretty much still needed for deep learning because uh, not all the operations are feasible for GPU. There are some operations just naturally not a good fit for GPU. So you still need a CPU for certain operations. And also, CPU is typically the way to interact with I.O. And finally, you have a GPU. That's a heavy lifting piece to be done. But if you look into that, the biggest problem is that GPU is uh, the most expensive one. And uh, inappropriately, uh, if you are going to run your authorization, you'll notice that if the deep learning is not that scheduled very nicely, you are going to waste a lot of GPU. And that's a big uh, waste in, for your investment. If you look into the uh, diagram shown in, in the slide on the top, you could see that uh, you, you do a batch processing. You take the data from the input. Uh, it passes to CPU for pre-processing. The next step is a pass to GPU for training and inference. As you can see, uh, until data has reached to a GPU, uh, your GPU is going to be idle, and you waste a lot of resource. On the bottom, that's the optimization of your authorization and the scheduling. In this case, you try to build an I.O. pipeline such that the data will be delivered to GPO as soon as possible. And once it's in GPO, most of the time, you can do the training and do the I.O. in parallel such that you fully utilize your GPO. Uh, and that's, that's the efficiency we talk about for authorization. There are several different ways for uh, ultra, uh, deep learning authorization. The most common way is the so-called pyramid server model. And uh, for TensorFlow, that's, uh, that's probably the, uh, that has been in place for since, since almost the beginning. The pyramid server model essentially define a pyramid server, which could be a, uh, a a subset of servers that's dedicated for uh, saving parameters. Uh, you also have worker node, which is uh, GPU heavy. Uh, the, the workflow for parameter server model is that for each worker node, it's going to collect a subset of data and it's going to calculate. It's going to calculate the uh, gradient. The partial gradient will be passed to the parameter server. When parameter server collect all the gradient, it will do the calculation, gets the weight, and the weight will be further feeded back into the worker node to do the update. This process will continue. Uh, parameter server, like I mentioned, has been pretty much in place for quite several years, and uh, people invest a lot of money, invest a lot of resource to improve that. There are some debating about whether parameter server is the best way to handle uh, deep learning authorization. 
the biggest concern is that uh, uh, there are some people, there are some discussion about the uh, uh, parameter server probably best, parameter server model probably best fitted for scenarios where you have your uh, computer power all seated on the same uh, machine so that your memory are shared by different GPUs. But in case of distributed deep learning, your GPUs are actually scattered around. They could be on different hosts, and they had to talk to a parameter server. When they talk to a parameter server, they had to go through a network uh, uh, transfer, and their huge amount of data are transferred back and forth between parameter server and the worker node. That could be a really big burden to to your training. Uh, but anyway, the for in the old days in TensorFlow, parameter server is pretty much the only only potential model you can run for distributed deep learning. Uh, recently, people have been talking about if we can use some other ways to do the distributed deep learning. Uh, most people actually come to uh, most people actually uh, resort to the MPI model. The MPI uh, distributed uh, 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 distributed uh, uh, parallel processing has been resolved in a way for a long time, and there are several ways to do the uh, there are several ways in MPI to do the calculation. Uh, in MPI, uh, there are several models for reduce operation. One is uh, reduce, another is all uh, reduce. So I'm going to show example of uh, of the reduce. So what is the reduce? Reduce. Uh, if you look into a graph, that's going to show you uh, exactly how the reduce is essentially just for each node. You are going to do the calculation, and uh, you, if you look into this graph, you try to do a summation. When you do the summation, you start with a bottom node. You do the calculation, do the summation, and at each node, you're going to sum up. Uh, and uh, for each step, you do a reduce once until you reach the root node. So if you show it that, uh, interactively, it's going to be like that. So the final step is that you reach to the root node, which is the summation of all your node. That's 28. Let's uh, reduce. Uh, MPI also have other another of of so called all reduce. So what is all reduce? The all reduce is uh, it's essentially the same as the reduce except when the summation has been calculated, reach to the root node. Instead of just stop here, you're going back and broadcast back to every node. So every every node knows your result. So if you're looking this way, you try to do the summation. You start with the bottom node, one and the two, that's uh, three, and the plus five, that's eight. You do another summation, that's another node update. And the, another summation, you reach the root node. Once you reach the root node, the, the result 28 will be broadcasted to every node. So it's going to be like that. So that's a so-called R reduce. So to sum up, the R reduce is a reduce plus broadcast. And uh, for, man, for many people familiar with uh, uh, MPI, they believe that's, uh, that's a more efficient way of doing distributed uh, uh, calculations. So let's go back to revisit parameter server, because like I said, in in TensorFlow, for a long time, parameter server is parameter server model is a standard way of doing distributed deep learning. Uh, the debating is about uh, parallelize on a machine and parallelize in a cluster might be different things. Uh, many people believe that uh, parameter server model is uh, only suitable for parameter uh, parallelize on a machine. It's not suitable uh, to parallelize task in a cluster, and it's kind of controversy. Um, the, the biggest burden for a parameter server is that the cross-device communication cost is very high. But unfortunately, a huge effort has been invested over the years, so 
you probably can only take that. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time discuss about uh, Permit Server, mostly because uh, if you talk about all the existing machine learning or traditional frameworks, they actually have the assumption that uh, they use Permit Server, and that's not necessarily the best approach. So that's kind of like uh, making uh, the decision of choosing the best uh, so-called deep learning for uh, deep learning optimization frameworks kind of difficult because whatever framework you try to choose, it may not uh, exactly fit the scenario you want to achieve. achieve. Because uh, uh, in this field, a lot of things are changing very frequently. So many of the frameworks, if you, for example, if you use uh, some of framework, you probably notice that they cannot even run with a new version of TensorFlow. So that's going to be a big issue. Uh, anyway, the, if we if we look into the optimization for deep learning, we notice there are several things. If we summarize uh, the past uh, uh, diagram, we, we mentioned about the uh, parameter server model, about the uh, reduce and all reduce model. Uh, they all require stateful metadata. And uh, they also require life cycle management, which come up to the uh, situation where we feel like uh, we probably can use Kubernetes for our tradition. Uh, and also, when we talk about our Kubernetes, we also think it probably makes sense to have uh, Kubernetes operators for machine learning as well, because it's just a natural fit to manage stateful data and to manage the life cycle. So let's go to Kubernetes operators. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to just uh, briefly cover several operators and the uh, needs Kubiflow uh, organization. The TFR operator, uh, PyTorch operator, and MPI operators. Uh, PyTorch is, uh, it's probably has a focus on PyTorch, uh, Py which may have some competition with TensorFlow, but I want to cover this part as well. A TF operator, that's obviously, it's uh, it tied to TensorFlow. Uh, it supports TensorFlow. It also supports TensorFlow TF distributed strategy. So this one has uh, a, a slightly better in that uh, TF distributed. Uh, it's relatively new. And uh, TF distributed, it's actually support a different uh, uh, strategies and the backend like MPI, MCCO, Permit Server, and TPO model. Uh, the TPO is uh, uh, the the chip set, uh, uh, the chip de designed by Google. That's a tensor processor unit. PyTorch operator has a focus on torch distrib distribute uh, torch distribute module. Uh, it also has support for MPI and MCCO. Horror world, that's uh, developed by uh, by Uber. Uh, Horror world actually have uh, has a wider uh, support for different frameworks. But I want to to point out that uh, some of the, uh, the uh, some of the distribution strategies are probably not exactly uh, not exactly fit for a new version of TensorFlow. But anyway, we we just. Uh, Show, uh, we just sh uh, show the uh, those uh, TF operators and MPI operators to be deployed on Kubeflow. So as you could see, they are pretty much very similar. The difference is that uh, so first of all, you have a different kind of uh, job. There's a TF job and the MPI job. The the spec is. Uh, either TF repli uh, replica spec or MPI replica spec. The command line is uh, slightly different, but other than that, uh, it's pretty much the same. So the, the container image uh, are, the, are the same. Uh, so let's, let's look at the, uh, if you have a TensorFlow, let's start with a TensorFlow program. So how do we run a TensorFlow program? You install TensorFlow, and uh, you can also install TensorFlow I/O, which give you the TF dataset uh, support. So the first line, of course, is to load the data 
into into data set. That's uh, that's the first line of what they said equals the MNIST data set. The data set will do some transformation, which uh, which is necessary because you need to do some pre-processing so that your your data set is in a flow state to uh, uh, flow state to data types. You also do a batch of one thousand because batch uh, batch is the way to to help you to for your data to fit into a GPO in one process. If you pass the data one by one, it may not uh, be very efficient because uh, the data transfer from uh, CPO or from memory to GPO is also very expensive. Uh, so next is the uh, is the uh, model building. As we mentioned now, in TensorFlow 2.0, everything has been consolidated into uh, into curves. So you try to build a model. That's going to be a sequential model. The first uh, you, uh, the first layer is a flatten. And uh, then you come up with a dense layer. Dense layer is standard layer. The next layer is a dropout. Dropout is a, is a technique to prevent the overfitting. Uh, essentially, uh, if you define a dropout with a, in, the, in this model, you have a dropout with a rate of 20%. Uh, that essentially means uh, uh, during each phase of the training, uh, for every node, the, the chance this node will be dropped, and this this chance is twenty percent. This will help prevent the uh, will help prevent the overfitting problem you normally encounter when you build uh, when you build a new network. The last layer is a dense layer as well. So as we can see in TensorFlow 2.0, everything has been simplified. So if you build a model, the next step is to compile the model. That's one line. And after that, it's a model.fit essentially give you the training. Uh, the data set has been passed in. Uh, the last line, uh, as you can see, that's evaluated. That's actually the inference uh, uh, phase. You can do that, uh, or you can output optionally skip this step if you only focus on training. So the this program we are talking about the just the build a build a model and the running down TensorFlow. Now we talk about the distribution. Of course that's a focus of this talk. So how do we do uh, distributed uh, training? So there are several strategies. One strategy in TensorFlow now has a mirror strategy. Uh, it's actually consolidated a lot. With the mirror strategy, uh, all you need to do is just uh, define scope of uh, with mirror the strategy dot scope. Uh, and the, the model compile can be done automatically, which seems to be nice, right? Um, we talk about the mirror strategy. We also want to mention that uh, in the old days, you have uh, when you do distributed training, you have uh, other tools available that can help you. For example, like uh, Hover World. If you combine TensorFlow with Hover World, it's pretty much similar, except that you have to pass different options and use callbacks to to achieve the to achieve the the result. Uh, one thing I want to point out is in, in this example you have TF train, but TF train has been deprecated in TensorFlow 2.0 as well, so it's uh, kind of unfortunately. <laughs> like I said, there are a lot of things in TensorFlow 2.0, so which actually makes things a little bit messy. But that's also that's also a good thing because it actually point it actually give you a brief idea of how fast this area is moving forward every day. Like we talk about 1.0, just like a, how long, how long time ago, like one or two years ago, and all of a sudden we jump into 2.0, a lot of things change, like a, uh, like a parameter server model, like the TF train has been replaced, a deprecated even TF estimator, which used to be uh, the default, uh, default way of building a model for many programs now all has been gone in 2.0. Uh, 
Uh, let, let's do a comparison. But anyway, let's do a comparison. So as you can see in TensorFlow 2.0 versus Hover, uh, they're pretty much the same. You build a similar model. You When you do the distribution, because it's in Python, so a lot of details has been abstracted and highlighted. So you can see uh, it's trying to make your life easier. We also try to cover a little bit of PyTorch plus Howroad. Because Howroad, one thing with Howroad is that uh, even if uh, it's not exactly a fit for TensorFlow 2.0, it still has some usage with MPI and with uh, PyTorch. So you can see they behave slightly differently, but they are pretty much similar as well. So uh, that's one of the positive side of a different uh, of a framework that can support different uh, uh, open source software. Uh, let's just uh, go back to uh, uh, TFL operator versus MPI operator. They are pretty much uh, uh, very similar as well. Uh, as you can see, they, they 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 abstract all the details. So now you can see the, the even the YAML specification for your Kubernetes uh, for running your Kubernetes operators are very much similar, except for the last command line that's uh, slightly different. So as uh, as we discussed, this field is the two too fast in moving forward. Every day, a lot of things change. I mean, if uh, actually, if you if you try to install, for example, TensorFlow, and you try to install nightly, and you probably notice that whatever you're trying to to run may not work after like a month. And uh, within several months, uh, TensorFlow 2.0 will be released, and uh, there will be further change. Uh, so it's it's really hard to <laughs> to conclude what's the best solution. For you to select the moment, because uh, uh, whatever that is, uh, the you have to make sure uh, your authorization framework can support the best software with the latest version that's uh, stable, right? So, 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 what's the what's the conclusion coming out with the? To this state, the conclusion is that uh, if you want to focus on uh, deep learning authorization, uh, first of all, you have to focus on trying to uh, fully utilize your GPU because that's the essential piece. Uh, otherwise, uh, deep learning authorization is probably probably not worth a lot of effort to to waste time on that. Another piece is uh, if you try to uh, people tend to dis debating about if you want to find a framework that's going to support our platform or our frameworks, or you want to find a, a framework that's going to dedicate for something. Uh, it's, it's really hard to say. Like I said, uh, initially TensorFlow only have a, a parameter server uh, for distributed TensorFlow. Uh, and later on, we have the mirror uh, strategy. We also have uh, like our reduce strategy introduced in TensorFlow TF distribute that actually simplify a lot of things. Uh, I think uh, I think that's uh, that's something you want to take uh, take into consideration when you try to come up with a solution that's going to build for uh, so called uh, AI ops or so called. Uh, uh, machine learning on Kubernetes because whatever you're trying to build, it may not be feasible after maybe just several months. Uh, I, I see a lot of people just uh, smiling, just think, okay, what exactly are you trying to deliver? Uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, I think that's a static call for, for, for the current state of uh, distributed, distributed machine learning uh, field. It, too tied to uh, a distributed framework, and it's probably hard to come up with a stable solution at the moment. If you try to come up with stable solution, I'm sorry, probably uh, in several months you probably realize it cannot even run some of the latest version. Uh, in but one thing is uh, one thing I would like to recommend is a lot of people mentioned. So what exactly are you going to do? Uh, I think a Kubi flow could be a framework that you can you can try. There are several reasons. First of all, Kubi flow is a very 
uh, actively developed, which means uh, uh, finite framework uh, uh, mechanisms, the query flow will try to catch up as soon as possible. Uh, secondly, Quickflow is has a very big community. As far as I know, Quickflow has a lot of uh, developers actually countering to that. They try to make an adjustment as soon as possible. So if uh, the, the upstream uh, framework like TensorFlow make a change, Quickflow tend to catch up very soon. Uh, yeah, that's uh, I think that's uh, that's pretty much uh, for. For today's talk, the another thing I want to mention is the QuickFlow also has uh, several uh, shared API and uh, best practices. They have a common standardized uh, API spec. They have a base uh, job controller interface. Uh, they consolidate all that in one uh, in in one repo, but they have different uh, uh, different uh, issue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they they consolidated those common uh, common API spec, uh, common utility functions into one repo, but they have different ways of deploy uh, different framework. Like they have a TF operator, uh, PyTorch operator, and they also have MPI operators. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty much uh, for today's talk. Any any question? Uh, regarding sort of model serving, uh, what's your uh, recommended technology, Selden or others? Okay, that's a <laughs> that's another interesting topic. Uh, you, if you talk about like uh, you're talking about uh, uh, serving models, like uh, I mean, of course you have a uh, uh, TF serving. Uh, that <laughs> TF serving is one that's uh, coming out of uh, Google as well, but I think they are also falling behind with uh, two dollar. Falling behind. Yes, it's uh, it's not it, compatible with uh, two point models. Uh, in two dollar, a lot of things have changed. Remember, in TensorFlow two dollar, first of all, you have an eager execution enabled by default. Secondly, in two so. When people you when in the past when one dot o loud one dot x a lot of the frameworks use the TF estimator as a default framework. Now this framework is being phased out. Of course, um, TensorFlow is still supported TF estimator, but that doesn't mean it's a first class system anymore. To be honest, so I can only say a lot of things will change pretty soon for TF serving as well. And also in TensorFlow 2.0, uh, another concept is the so-called TF function. TF function essentially is a small subgraph that help you to optimize. Remember in 2.0, uh, a static graph has been replaced by an eager execution. In eager execution, every step, uh, it can run imperatively. But this actually slows down the speed of uh, training dramatically. So one way to improve that is you can define a small function. A small function is essentially a subgraph or a small graph. This graph uh, you can apply. So that gives you the advantage of uh, graph optimization. At the same time, it uh, still gives you the eager execution capability to allow you to do the debug. So with TF function, if you try to uh, write a, if you try to, let's say you try to write a, uh, write a model, you can come with, a, uh, you can run it in an eager mode, and if you stabilize and decide to say your model is pretty much free, you can convert that into TF function to speed up. So that's another thing that's going to help you. Uh, like I said, a lot of things are in the change in 2.0, but I think that's all good change because, uh, like I mentioned, uh, for model building, you have a curves consolidated. You don't you don't need to think about which is the best way to build a model uh, among the four different ways of 
building that. And also with eager execution, that really helps a lot to, for debugging purposes. Thank okay. uh, any, you. Any other questions? OK. okay. Thanks, thanks uh, everyone, for coming here. Uh, have a wonderful day. Yeah. <laughs>